This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk a little bit more about what makes Bitcoin so unique and why people become Bitcoin maximalists. I did talk about this in yesterday's video. If you watch that video first, this one will make a lot more sense. That video is called Bitcoin Eats All Altcoins, and I, I will uh, link to that below. But just to recap what I did in that video is I demonstrated why if, you're, if your altcoin, your other cryptocurrency, has a cool feature, it will eventually be added to Bitcoin, thus rendering your altcoin obsolete. A lot of long-term investors in altcoins don't realize that this is the path, this is the competitive path for new forms of money that, can, that, that compete and the best form of money wins. Bitcoin is the hardest form of money that's ever existed. It is the best form of money because it's optimized for security, scarcity, and verifiability at the base layer, at the blockchain layer. Bitcoin, the blockchain size is kept small enough so that anyone can run a full node. No one does this in Ethereum. It's, it's much too difficult. The blockchain's getting much too large. People outsource their full nodes to companies like Infura, and then you have smaller uh, partial nodes that trust the bigger nodes. One of the things we keep talking about that's very important to notice and to recognize is that there are always engineering trade-offs. And Bitcoin seems to, opt, seems to occupy this very special space among trade-offs. So what you're always uh, trying to balance is speed, security, and decentralization when it comes to money and especially to cryptocurrencies. This is true in the fiat system as well. Visa is very fast but it's not decentralized, it's not permissionless or censorship resistant. You can be refused access to this network. Maybe you won't be issued a credit card. Maybe you're a seller who will not be allowed to accept Visa as payments. As we pointed out to Visa runs on the US banking rails, which itself is very centralized and uh, not permissionless. And the entire US banking system is controlled by the US Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and ultimately backed by proof of work in the form of proof of war. We bomb people like Saddam Hussein who try to sell their money using, try to sell their oil using euros instead of US dollars. So Visa itself is an unfair, unfair comparison to Bitcoin simply because Visa is a very abstracted solution that runs on US banking rails. So here's the trade-off, speed, security, decentralization. Wells Fargo, if you have a savings account there, it's quite secure. Unfortunately, you're holding fiat money, which is being debased by anywhere from 3 to 20% a year, depending how you measure inflation in the money supply. But it is basically secure. Your Wells Fargo account is secure, but it's not decentralized. It's not permissionless. It's secure unless they decide to freeze your account. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I'd encourage you to hit that subscribe and like button and also share this video with some of your friends who are investigating Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Ethereum, really the uh, largest market cap compared to Bitcoin. Ethereum has this problem that's not truly decentralized because it did not have an immaculate conception. It had a very dirty history, large uh, pre-mine where insiders were awarded large amounts of coins or sold them at very low prices in the pre-sale. And now they're in the process of virtue signaling uh, by moving from proof of work to proof of stake, which is just another way of rewarding those original large holders who were awarded money, uh, awarded ETH, ETH in the uh, huge pre-mine. No one runs their own full node, as we said. And so this is not a decentralized currency. They've changed their, uh, Ethereum has changed its monetary policy many times over the last six or so years. It's uh, you have a powerful centralized dev team around Vitalik Buterin, and uh, so this is the problem. It's not it's not uh, decentralized, and it also this move to proof of stake, where you have to stake coins to validate transactions. This really does, uh, in many ways, recreate the fiat money system, where the more money you have, the more you can make the rules and control the system. By contrast, Bitcoin is very different with its proof of work system. Now, there are a lot of people who do not live in the real world. They're basically adult children, and they say that they want a decentralized, secure, fast cryptocurrency that uses zero energy. Good luck with that. 
proof of work is the only fair way to secure a currency and keep it decentralized. If you want something that exists in an ideal world rather than the real world, you can try Unicorn, Rainbow, Dreamer Coin, or whatever altcoin is being is being promoted by criticizing Bitcoin's proof of work algorithm. Now, the other unique thing about Bitcoin, it really is a historical accident that can never be repeated. It grew under the radar. It started off very small. It had an immaculate conception, by which I mean the founder was present really early on, Satoshi Nakamoto. He disappeared. The early distribution of coins was fair and open to everyone. It was not profit motivated. The people who were into Bitcoin at the very beginning were libertarian cypherpunks, cryptographers, really geeky, uh, geeky people. It's very different from from what happens today if you want to issue a new coin. It's all uh, money motivated. It's all centralized, and it's all traceable uh, to a founding a founding team who usually gives themselves awards themselves a very large pre mine. So Bitcoin had this immaculate conception. It grew very slowly under the radar. It was able to get big and get distribution without regulators stopping it. And now it's so big, it's like uh, it's like a worldwide virus or a worldwide weed. It cannot be stopped. And so this is a very fortunate thing that it was able to grow in such a decentralized manner and have a fair early distribution of coins. Distribution of coins continues to be fair. You ha- you have to do work for it. You have to do proof of work and uh, spend lots of money on electricity. Or you have to purchase Bitcoin from someone else. You can't just print up your own Bitcoin and issue it to yourself. If we had another historical accident like Bitcoin that created, let's call it Bitcoin 2, and it, everything was, was the same, you had this immaculate conception, it was decentralized, it didn't have a pre-mine, it would never be able to catch up to Bitcoin simply because Bitcoin has this head start, has the very high market cap, uh, has the highest market cap of any cryptocurrency, has very high liquidity, good liquidity for institutional investors who want to be able to get in and out. It's got the global brand and other network effects. It has this whole ecosystem that surrounds it. Ethereum has a very nice ecosystem. DeFi is very interesting, but unfortunately, it's uh, it's a centralized system and so much depends on um the validators who are going to run the the proof of stake, uh, the proof of stake mining operations, and it depends on Vitalik, and the direction that he wants to push, push it. So it's it's uh, there's no analogy with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is completely unique, both for historical reasons and for structural reasons. And this is why anyone who studies this field eventually becomes a Bitcoin maximalist. Now the biggest category that Bitcoin wins is the store. Of value category or the store value contest. Store value is just how you deliver yourself wealth in the future or your descendants, how you preserve your purchasing power. If you put $100 under your mattress, it won't be worth as much in 20 years from now. If you put Bitcoin, quote unquote, under your mattress, it will maintain your purchasing power in a similar way that gold has functioned historically. Store value is the largest category out there. It's the largest total addressable market, or TAM. Bitcoin is like gold. It's like gold 2.0, but better. And so this largest category, what makes it so large is that people can store all their wealth in Bitcoin today, and also future, uh, future inventors, future people who want to store their wealth will also be able to store it in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin really has an infinite potential market cap. It's not like some utility coin that you use to manage inventory at a company or do something like that. It really has this very large uh, total addressable market. Now, how does new money form? If you, uh, I'll link to a great paper by Nick Szabo that was originally published even before the invention of Bitcoin called Shelling Out. And he traces the movement of new money. We don't really know because a lot of this is sort of shrouded in uh, the myths of history, the origins of gold. But uh, the uh, an, a, a theory that a lot of people uh, accept is that money starts off as a collectible. Maybe you collect pretty shells or pretty, pretty nuggets of gold or silver. And then eventually, uh, if it's scarce, it becomes a good store of value. Or if it's relatively scarce compared to other collectibles out there, once it becomes a store of value where people um, 
people store their wealth. In the Old Testament, for example, you see many of the many of the characters like Abraham, in addition to having uh, gold, having cattle and sheep, they also have gold and silver. So at this point, it becomes a store of value. And once it's a store of value, then you can exchange it with other people, it becomes a medium of exchange. And if enough people are exchanging this form of money, then it becomes a unit of account. You begin to think in terms of dollars or euros or gold. So gold followed, uh, anthropologists believe that gold followed a similar history where you started off with gold as ornament or decoration or being used in religious ceremonies, and then it became a store of value. And then people began to trade wealth using gold or gold coins as a store of value, and then eventually pricing everything in gold. And this was the, the uh, gold standard, which uh, existed for, uh, for many hundreds of years. Bitcoin followed a similar evolution. It started off as a collectible, just something cool to have for geeky cryptographers and cypherpunks. And now it's in the process of becoming a global store of value. This is the narrative that's won. This is why uh, institutional investors are accumulating Bitcoin. Now, it's still volatile. People say it can't be a store of value because it's volatile. Well, Apple, Amazon stocks have been a very good store of value over the past 20 years. In fact, they've not just stored your value, but they've increased it. These early assets are always volatile simply because even though Bitcoin is a stable protocol, it does the same thing, it keeps kicking out a, a new block every, every 10 minutes. Nothing really changes with it, but the amount of money outside of Bitcoin is still very large compared to the amount of value or money inside of Bitcoin. And so when you have flows in and out over the short term, this does lead to fluctuations, huge fluctuations, in fact, in Bitcoin's value as we've seen. But if you hold Bitcoin for four years or more, three years or more, you can back test this and see that you've it's it's stored value over those those time periods. So people like Peter Schiff who say it's not a good store of value because it's volatile, they just don't understand this. And once Bitcoin becomes much less valuable, it'll be at a much, much higher market cap, probably at one to ten million dollars per Bitcoin. If you wait for it be to become less volatile, just like if you waited for Amazon to become less volatile, you missed out on the whole run up. But Bitcoin does function as a very good store of value simply because of the scarcity. Now, Bitcoin optimizes layer one, which is the blockchain itself, as we talked about yesterday, for the store of value function. And then layer two solutions will be used to expand into the medium of exchange function. You can still send Bitcoin on layer one. It's actually fairly cheap. You can send a billion dollars for $7, $10, $15, depending on the time of day and the, the uh, congestion on the network. But if you want to buy a cup of coffee with it, it makes sense to use a layer two solution like the Lightning Network. That being said, a lot of people don't realize that even on layer one, people say it can only handle seven transactions per second. Uh, this, will, this will go up over time, but even at its current, uh, current level, each, each of those transactions can be very large or very small. So you can settle a $10 transaction or seven $10 transactions in a second, or you can settle seven $10 billion transactions in a second. So that would, if it's the latter, you'd be securing $70 billion in one, uh, in one second. So layer one can scale as the value of the individual transactions goes up. What's really important though is that this layer one is secure. This is the, 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 the base layer and is go going to become the global settlement layer. It'd be like gold, where you can settle everything in gold, but it's much easier to move around and to verify and to assay much easier than gold is. And then layer two solutions can be used for smaller transactions and speed. The whole point of Bitcoin is that you have this immaculate conception, you have a foundation of stone that it's built on, the proof of work algorithm, and it's able to secure uh, almost a trillion dollars in value very securely in a permissionless in a permissionless way. Jack Dorsey at, of Twitter uh, really alluded to Bitcoin's immaculate conception in this tweet, saying that it's extremely unlikely we get another Bitcoin. The conditions needed to create and sustain Bitcoin were very special. I assume this is what he is talking about, Bitcoin's immaculate conception. Now, you have a lot of people who don't understand this 
background. So you have XRP Army, which says, well, XRP is cheaper and faster than Bitcoin. I don't want to investigate XRP too much in this video. I've made probably four or five videos about it already. XRP had a huge pre-mine. It's centralized. It's being sued by the SEC. It's not as secure as Bitcoin. And it has these problems. It did not have an immaculate conception. You had a bunch of XRP printed up and they magically made their way over to a corporation called Ripple Labs. Just by coincidence, of course, Ripple Labs did not issue XRP. They just benefited from magically getting it. And this is one reason that they're being sued by the SEC. If you want something that's cheap and fast, you can use layer two on Bitcoin and you don't have any of the the incentive problems, the pre-mine problems, uh, the centralization problems that you have with XRP and Ethereum. So Strike is an app that's built on top of the Lightning Network. It allows you to send money anywhere in the world, not paying any fees. And this uses the layer two uh, level of Bitcoin. And it, it basically works like this. this. Let's say I want to send $100, 100 US dollars to someone in the UK. I use the Strike app. It converts that $100 to Bitcoin instantly and then sends it to the UK using the Lightning Network, which is a layer two built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Once it gets there, they have a Lightning node that converts that Bitcoin into, into British pounds and then sends it to whoever you want in the UK or whoever wants British pounds. This is an instantaneous transaction. It's free. It's already being used worldwide for remittances great uh, example here being used in El Salvador and allowing uh, people in the U.S. to send remittances to countries like El Salvador and bypass centralized, bulky, expensive solutions, historical solutions like uh, like Western Union, for example. If you want to investigate, uh, learn a little bit more about Strike and Jack Mahler's, I made this video, which I will link to before. It's on days like this when cryptocurrency is selling off quite um, quite violently, that it's really important to understand what's in your wallet. What do you own? Do you own XRP because it's faster and yet you don't understand all these nuances, all these historical intricacies, as well as uh, how Bitcoin fundamentally solves for store of value and then goes on from there to become a medium of exchange and ultimately a unit of account. I believe in our lifetime, uh, we will begin to think in terms of Satoshis. One Bitcoin is 100 million Satoshis. People will begin to mentally price things in Satoshis or Sats. This doesn't mean that fiat currency is going to go away. Uh, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs are on the way. They're already present in China. We'll probably get one in the US within a few years. But these are not competitors to Bitcoin simply because their potential supply is unlimited. And so in the future, you'll store your wealth, you'll store your value in Bitcoin. If you need to spend something at the store and they only expect it and they only accept U.S. dollars, you'll quickly convert your Bitcoin to some U.S. dollars. But you'll store most of your value in U.S. dollars. I'm, I'm sorry, in Bitcoin, in the same way that someone maybe in El Salvador or Argentina, they won't hold the local currency, which is being devalued very quickly. They'll hold their savings in physical assets, maybe like in, in, in food or motorcycle or even in U.S. dollars. And then when they need to spend locally, they'll convert a little bit of U.S. dollars to the uh, to the Bolivar or the Peso or whatever the local fiat currency is. It's very important to know what you own during sell-offs like today. And if you understand Bitcoin's history and its value proposition, it makes it much easier to hold throughout the volatility. And you don't have to worry about all the problems associated with other cryptocurrencies like XRP and Ethereum. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.